Good day. For those of you who don't know us, we're the instructional staff for ECE 150, professors here in Patel and Werner Dietl, and Douglas Harder. In this topic, we will discuss the selection sort algorithm and see an implementation. So in this topic, we will describe the selection sort algorithm to sort an array. We will consider a straightforward implementation of this algorithm in C++. However, we will then observe that it makes more sense to use helper functions to simplify the writing of the code for one algorithm as the functions themselves take over the additional work. We will then make a simple modification to the implementation that actually improves its functionality and we will consider appropriate tests for this implementation. We will then briefly describe the execution time and benefits of this algorithm. Now suppose you start with an array where the entries are unsorted. That is, the first entry is likely not the smallest value and the last entry is not likely the largest value and so on and so forth throughout the array. How could we possibly rearrange the entries so that the final result is sorted? That is, the first entry is the smallest, the next entry is the next smallest, and so on and so forth. Selection sort describes an algorithm that takes an unsorted array and... All right, now, as with linear and binary search, the selection sort algorithm can actually be described independent of any programming language. And that's actually preferable because you want to be able to understand what the algorithm does. So very simply, given an array of n entries or an array with capacity n, the first thing you do is you find the largest of the entries and swap it with the last entry of the array. Next, find the largest entry in the first n minus 1 entries and swap that with the second last entry. That places the second largest entry in the second last position. Next, find the largest entry of the first n minus 2 entries and swap that entry with the third last entry placing the third largest entry in the third last position. You keep on doing this until you only have one entry to inspect, but that basically will end up being the smallest entry anyway. So we will be finished. All right, now to implement this in C++, we will use the following function declaration. The name of the function is selection sort. The first argument is array, and the second argument is its capacity. Now, this function will not return anything, so therefore its return type is declared to be void. Now, remember that when an array is passed to a function, it is the address of that array. That is, it is the address of the first entry of the array that is passed to the function. So any change to the entries of the array in the function itself will affect the original array as well. So basically, we will be sorting the array that was passed to this function. Now, let's look at a concrete example because this might be easier to understand. Let's look at an array that has a known capacity of 10. Well, in that case, on the first iteration, what we would do is we would find the largest entry between indices 0 and 9 and swap that largest entry with the entry that is at index 9 because that will place the largest entry at the end of the array. And then we'll proceed from there. But let's tabulate this. So basically, we would proceed as follows. Let's have the index that we are starting our search at, the index we are finalizing our search at, 
And then once we have found that largest entry, which entry we're going to swap it with. So with the first search or first iteration, we will find the largest entry between indices 0 and 9. And wherever that largest entry is, we will swap that entry with the entry at index 9. Next, we will find the largest entry between indices 0 and 8 and swap that entry with the entry at index 8. In fact, we will keep on going on until we have searched for the largest entry between indices 0 and 1, that is, there are two entries, and once we have found that largest entry, we will copy that largest entry, or swap it, with the second index in the array. After this, there's only one entry left, and that value must be, at this point, the smallest entry, so we are done. Well, to implement this, notice that we could have a loop variable k that starts at 9 and goes all the way down to 1. So let us see how we would write this as a for loop. Well, here the capacity is 10, so we would initialize the loop variable k with capacity minus 1. With every single step, we would decrement the loop variable, and we would continue iterating as long as the loop variable is greater than 0. OK, easy enough. So we could start our implementation as follows. We have a for loop where the loop variable has as its initial value capacity minus 1. With every single step, we decrement the value of k and we continue iterating so long as k is greater than 0. What we will do then is we will find the index of the maximum entry between indices 0 and k. And having found the index of the maximum entry, we will swap that entry with the entry at index k. So this is what we have to implement. Now, some of you, perhaps a lot of you, may be very tempted to proceed as follows. So here's what you may consider just doing. Let's just implement everything. So for example, for every single iteration of the loop, we will assume that the largest entry is at index 0. We'll then loop between 1 and k and see if there's any entries that are larger than the index, than the value at index stored at max index, and if so, update it. And then once this loop finishes, we can swap the two entries. Now, just to make absolutely sure that our algorithm works, we will conclude by having an assertion that is sorted on this array with a given capacity does in fact return capacity. As you may recall, is sorted returns the capacity if the array is sorted, and if it is not sorted, it returns the index of the first entry of the array that is less than the previous entry. All right, so this may in fact be how you'd implement this, and this would be indeed correct. However, I'd like, you to, enc I'd like to encourage you to not use this approach. Instead, notice that the two operations that we've described, finding the entry or the index of the entry that has the maximum value and swapping two values are two well-defined operations. Wouldn't it be a lot nicer if we could just 
author two additional functions that implement these and then we could use these two functions. So for example, the swap function would take two arguments and they would be passed by reference and then they would swap those two entries. The find max function would take an array and a capacity and simply return the index of where it found the maximum entry in that array. Well, let's see how we would implement these two functions. Now, if we wanted to author a function that swapped two values, this is reasonably straightforward. Remember that we actually want to change the two values of the arguments that are passed, and therefore we will have to use pass by reference. So here, first and second are passed by reference. We have a local variable temp that is initialized with a value of first. First is then assigned the value of second, and then second is assigned the value of the local variable temp. But because first and second are both, both passed by reference, the original arguments will also have their original values changed. Now, something else. There is actually a swap function in the standard template library. Its name is standard double colon swap as you'd expect, and it works just like the function that we described above. This function is defined in the standard template library utility. And as you can guess, the utility library has a number of such utility functions that you may, under certain circumstances, require from time to time. In this course, you are welcome at any time to use the swap function, unless, of course, we explicitly ask you to author such a function. Now, similarly, authoring a function that finds the maximum entry of an array is reasonably straightforward as well. Now, in this case, because I'm returning the index, there has to be at least one entry, and therefore I will make an assertion that the capacity is greater than zero. I cannot find the index of the maximum entry of an array that has no entries. Next, I'm going to have a local variable max index that is initialized with the value zero. This is under the assumption that the entry at index 0 is the largest. What I will do next is walk through the array and see if there is anything larger than the value at index 0. At the end, hopefully max index will have the, va have the value of the index of the maximum entry of the array. So next we're going to have a for loop. The loop variable k will start at 1, and we will go up until capacity minus 1. So essentially, we are now going to inspect every other entry of the array other than the first. If we ever find an entry that has a value greater than the value currently at the array at max index, I will update max index to be this new index. So if this function loops correctly, then by the end of this for loop, max index will have the index at which the maximum entry is found. Thus, we can use these two functions to simplify our implementation of our selection sort algorithm. So to find the index of the maximum entry between indices 0 and k, we actually just have to call find max on the array 
with the capacity being k plus 1, because in that case it will search all the entries from 0 up until but not including k plus 1, which is all entries from 0 to k. Whatever that returns, it will be the value in that initializes the entry or local variable max index. Having found that, we can just swap the index, the entry at array k with the entry at max index. That's it. All right. So comparing the implementation where we just do everything in the function and the implementation where we use the two helper functions, notice that the second is much more succinct and actually much more clear. In the first imp implementation, we notice that there is a local variable index max, it's initially zero, and then, well, you'd have to figure out what that internal for loop does and you might figure out quickly that it gets the maximum entry and then below there there seems to be a swap. In the second case notice that it's actually quite self-explanatory. The local variable max index is initialized with the in index returned by find max on the array checking entries from 0 to k then we swap those two entries. It's a lot clearer at this point, which is in fact a little bit nicer because anyone can easily see what is going on. The other thing is, I can now use the find max function somewhere else and I don't have to re-implement it. Whereas what happens if I made a mistake in the implementation of find max in the first version of the function. If I've written the fu find max function once and tested it, I can now use it over and over again, and I'm guaranteed it will not fail. On the other hand, if every time I want to find the maximum entry of an array, if I actually explicitly perform the full implementation of find max, each time I do so, there's always the possibility I may introduce an error. So this second implementation is superior in many different ways. All right, that's it. We've finished our algorithm. However, you may be curious, is it possible to make a small incremental improvement? You don't have to worry about this if you're struggling at this point, but if you caught on to what we're discussing, you may consider the following. With every single iteration of the loop that we just performed, we are finding the maximum entry from index 0 to index k. We then swap what is at that index with what is at index k. Alright, not a problem that works. That is by definition selection sort. What happens if the maximum entry is already at the last index? Do we actually have to perform the swap? Well, probably not. So how could we avoid this? Well, one way we could do this is as follows. Find the maximum entry from index 0 up until index k minus 1, up until the entry right before the last entry we're considering. Now, only if that maximum entry is greater than what is at array k do we bother swapping the two. Okay. This is only going to change our implement slightly. The for loop is unchanged. However, now we will find the maximum entry between 
0 and k minus 1. So for this, we will call find max on the array with the capacity k. So that will find the maximum entry of the array between indices 0 and k minus 1. Now we will just check. Is the entry at max index greater than the entry at k? If so, swap the two. Otherwise, don't bother. Now, does this actually make our implementation more efficient? Well, once in a while it will avoid a swap and also every single time we are finding the maximum we will be always finding the maximum of one less entry. So yeah, it might do a slight improvement in performance. It's not going to change the overall behavior but it might be ever so slightly faster. All right. Now, the next step is, or actually even before we wrote the function, we should have created a number of tests to see whether or not our sorting algorithm works. Well, how do we proceed? Well, first of all, we should have one test that sorts an array of capacity zero. And of course, nothing should happen. Then we should sort an array of capacity 1, and that one entry should be left unchanged. We should sort all three possibilities for an array of capacity 2. That is, one where the two entries are in order, where the two entries are the same, and where the two entries are in reverse order. We could go even so far as to test all possibilities for an array of capacity 3, where all three entries are the same, where the smallest entry is duplicated, where the largest entry is duplicated, and where all three values are different. In all of these cases, the sorting algorithm should be able to sort all of the, these. Now we can't do everything so at this point, the most reasonable thing is just to pick an array of, say, capacity 100. And the three arrays that you'd want to test for sure are the first one, where the entries of the array are already in order, so nothing should happen to it. One where all of the entries are in reverse order, so the largest first, then the next largest, and so on and so forth, up until the smallest is the one at the end, and finally one that is completely random. This would probably be a sufficient test for such a function just to make sure you did not miss any of the boundary cases. Now one thing that's interesting about selection sort is that you can see from the description that it's going to take the same number of steps no matter what the array looks like, whether or not the array is sorted or reverse sorted, you're always going to get exactly the same number of steps taking place. Now, in your al course on algorithms and data structures, you're actually going to see that you can calculate the runtime by counting the number of statements that are executed. That's beyond the scope of this course, However, just very briefly, if the capacity of the array is n, then the number of statements that need to be executed is approximately a scalar multiple of, well, first we're finding the maximum of n minus 1 entries, then n minus 2, then n minus 3, and so on and so forth. So the total number of comparisons we have to do, for example, is on the order of n minus 1 times n all over 2. But again, this is what you'll focus on in your algorithms and data structures course. Now, this implementation has one benefit over all other sorting algorithms that you will learn, and that is 
that it has the num minimum number of changes to the entries of the array. And in some circumstances, this is actually a significant benefit. Indeed, in our second implement implementation, where we did not perform the swap if the last entry was already the largest, then if we start off with a sorted array, then no changes, including no unnecessary swaps, are made to the array. Here are the references, acknowledgements, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!